All right. Uh, welcome back, everybody. Uh, hope everyone's doing well. We're going to move on today and talk about the jawed fish. So we're going to start with everything now going to be being in the group Nathostomata, superclass Nathostomata, the jaw, jawed fish. So Agnatha without jaws. These are Nathostomata fish that have jaws. And the first of those groups is a class Chondrichthys, and these first appeared in the mid-Devonian period a long time ago. And they have a cartilage skeleton, and they have placoid scales that look like that. Uh, their teeth are derived from the placoid scales, so they're different than the teeth like that we have that are put into sockets. Um, and grow rather these are these are part of the outside uh, tissue of the shark that have moved inward um, and developed uh, scales um, they're essentially placoid scales that are modified to grow teeth and and since they have uh, since they're always growing new skin um, the the idea that they can develop these new placoid scale teeth means that sharks are continually replacing these modified placoid scale teeth as well. So they can replace them essentially every few days or so, depending on the shark. Um, they lack a, gla uh, a gas bladder. So most bony fish have this swim bladder that they can use to adjust the buoyancy in and that allows them to float at different depths. Sharks don't have that uh, swim bladder, but instead they have a very large liver and it's a large oily fatty liver and that makes sharks more buoyant than a lot of other animals because of their very large liver. Most animals have a very large liver but sharks even have a, uh, a, a more pronounced larger liver than most uh, animals even. They also have this structure called a spiral valve uh, in their intestines that looks like this. It's like a winding uh, structure that helps increase surface area, that allows them to digest food better. And they have a highly developed uh, sensory organs for a variety of things. They, they have, you know, they, they have um, eyesight that is okay, and they have a good sense of smell, and they can sense water pressure changes. Um, but they also have uh, these little pits on the front of their face, these little holes on the front, those are called the ampullae of Lorenzini, and those are used for detecting um, electrical signals. So they can detect small amounts of electrical impulses when an animal, such as a human or other animal, swims or its heart is beating, it gives off a, a slight electrical impulse and sharks can sense that. Now, it's um, it's a close range sort of sensory thing. So it, it is useful when sharks are hunting something that is fairly close. They're not swimming across the ocean, picking up an electrical signal from five miles away, but rather if they're within, you know, a short, you know, less than a meter distance, the ability to pick up electrical signals uh, is used by those ampullae of Lorenzini. It's probably less than even half a meter. Uh, so they've got to be very close. Uh, they have internal fertilization, which means the sperm has to be inserted into the female in the case of sharks. And the males use these structures called claspers uh, that you see here to inject the sperm. Females don't have the claspers, males do. Internal fertilization means the egg is fertilized inside the fish, not on the outside. Uh, but we'll see other fish do that differently. In terms of shark reproduction, there are different modes of reproduction that you can see in different sharks. And this is a good time to talk about sort of the different methods of things that you see. So, um, these are not just exclusive to sharks, but since this type of scenario comes up in sharks in so many different ways, it's a good opportunity to sort of discuss in general the kinds of reproductive uh, strategies that occur. So first, we have viviparity. Viviparity 
is kind of like in humans where um, you give birth to a live baby. Okay, so the mother um, in this case uh, feeds the baby via some sort of placenta structure and the baby grows inside the mother and comes out, you know, in the case of humans comes out as a baby and all that time has been receiving nutrients from the mother from the placenta. Hammerhead sharks and bull sharks are examples of viviparous uh, organisms or viviparity, meaning they give live birth. The babies are um, born alive um, and grow based on the nutrients they get from the mom. Okay. Um, similar to, well, another different, a different strategy is the ability to uh, deposit eggs. So oviparity is kind of like what you would see in a chicken. Um, a chicken gets um, pregnant, you know, gets fertilized, and then the chicken lays the egg, and the egg then is outside and develops inside the egg outside of the chicken, right? So that is an example of oviparity, and horn sharks do that. So horn sharks are kind of like how a chicken would be. They lay the egg, it's fertilized, and then the fertilized egg essentially develops outside the female and becomes the baby shark in this case, or a baby chick if it's a chicken. So those two uh, you should be familiar with because they're kind of like things you've seen before. So this is kind of like what we see in humans. This is what we see in like a chicken. This one's a little different for you and it's called oviviparity oviviparity. So it's kind of a combination of the two things combined. So in this case, what happens is the mother shark gives birth to a baby shark, which is like live birth, right? But the difference is um, the fertilized eggs are inside the female and they develop inside the female. So there's no placenta. What the shark eats after the eggs are formed doesn't really do anything to the eggs because the eggs are already formed. They're just retained in the body and the eggs hatch inside the shark and come out as baby sharks in this case. Uh, tiger sharks, great white sharks, and, and in fact, most sharks are oviviparous meaning that the eggs are fertilized and they're not they're not they're not receiving nutrients from the female once the eggs are formed but rather the eggs are retained inside the female kind of like a chicken egg if the chicken egg stayed inside the female chicken and then hatched out, which it doesn't in the chicken. But in the case of sharks, that's what happens is the egg is formed, but it's retained inside the female and it hatches outside. And uh, I'm sorry, the egg stays inside the female. It hatches inside the female and comes out um, as a baby shark. That's oviviviparous. Okay. Those are the different methodologies that sharks use for reproduction. Again, they're all internal fertilization. There's another one I'll just throw in here because it's in your lab slides, uh, but it really pertains instead to bony fish uh, and it's called oviparity. And oviparity is when a female lays eggs, which is what most bony fish do outside, and then males come along and fertilize those eggs afterwards. So in this case, the females laying the eggs like, you know, on some algae or on a rock and often will leave and the male comes along and fertilizes those eggs. It occurs outside of the body um, and the female and the male don't necessarily come into contact with one another because the male is fertilizing the eggs quite often after maybe the female has left. Okay, so sharks don't do that, but bony fish do um, and frogs do that. So I can throw that in there. These are the ones that sharks do you see there. Okay, so when we talk about the class chondrichthys, we'll talk about different sharks uh, in this group and they um, are in the subclass. Uh, we'll start with the elasmobranchia, which includes sharks, skates, and rays. They have two dorsal fins 
and an anal fin. So they're dorsal fin number one and two. They have five gill openings usually uh, there. And they have a nictating membrane, which is on the eye. It's on the bottom of the eye. It's like an eyelid that can come up and cover the eye, which helps in preventing the eye from getting injured when sharks you know, go to bite into something. And most of the time we'll see this heterocercal caudal fin. This is the caudal fin back here. It's the back fin. And the heterocercal part means that they're different. So the top part is usually much longer and bigger than you see on the bottom. That's a very characteristic shark looking structure. Other fish can have a heterocercal caudal fin but you very often see that in sharks, okay? And then we have the class osteichthyes. You notice I have it in quotes here because some people are, have suggested that uh, there isn't a class osteichthyes anymore, but rather that class should be broken into two, sarcopterygy and arctopterygy, which is what we'll go through here in a minute. Um, those um, are collectively the osteichthys. I like to keep the word osteichthys because it reminds me of them being the bony fish which separates them from sharks. So whether that is now a super class uh, or whatever you want to call it, it should be somewhere above this, in my opinion. It's in quotations. I do that a couple of times uh, where what they have down is not quite uh, what I want to see. Um, because I learned it a certain way. It's, it, it, it's all made up by humans. So what's exactly right or not um, is up to one person's particular opinion, I think. But anyway, so um, the bony fish have an ossified or bony endoskeleton. Uh, they have uh, lungs in some cases, which surprises you maybe, and a swim bladder, which they use to regulate buoyancy. Uh, unlike what you see in the sharks, uh, they have bony fin rays. So you'll see uh, in in like the um, ray fin fish or the bony fin fish, you'll see this bone structure and then you'll see these extensions here. And they have an operculum, uh, which is a, a bony gill covering. It's a plate that covers where the gills are. And if you watch a goldfish or other fish, when it's breathing, the movement of the operculum is how the water is moving in and across uh, the gills. Uh, they have different kinds of scales, ganoid, tenoid, or cycloid, but they don't have placoid scales. And there are two groups, like I said, the sarcopterygy and the actopterygy, either the lobe fin fish or the ray fin fish. And this is my basic anatomy of a fish here. I've got my dorsal fins. I've got my caudal fin here. Uh, not all, but most bony fish have some sort of homocercal caudal fin where the caudal fin is sort of the same on both the top and bottom lobes. Um, they have a lateral line, which other animals do as well, sharks as well, for example, that runs the length of the body. And the lateral line is very useful for detecting pressure changes, motion, uh, vibration. If you've ever been fishing before, um, Whoever you're fishing with will always tell you, you got to be very, very quiet uh, because the fish can hear you and you'll scare them and you won't catch any fish. That's probably true because of the lateral line, um, but it's also probably true because they want you to be quiet because they want peace. Um, I used to, I think, annoy my grandfather and my dad when we would fish. So that's how I learned it. And, and, and now as I take my kids fishing, I'm like, that's a good lesson. And I don't even know if it's really true about the fish probably is, but it makes sense from a, from a parenting and a fishing point of view. Those, the, the, those worlds both match. So we're going to go with it. Uh, so it is a, it has to be true, um, because it works in both cases. Uh, anyway, there you go. So there's probably some biological reason to as well as parenting. Uh, they have a swim bladder we already talked about that can be filled with air and it can be adjusted to increase or decrease buoyancy. Depending on where the fish is, it can float at different depths because the pressure is different. Um, and the lateral line, you don't need to know all the structures in it, but basically along the entire fish is this little pressure 
sensory, sensory cup. And there are these little microscopic uh, nerve fibers and, and sensory hairs inside there. And as they move, that creates a pressure change on those hairs and sends action potentials down that nervous system to the fish so it can hear along its body vibrations. It can sense um, vibrations in the water. Um, it's, it's a type of pressure sensory, which is very much like our hearing through our ears, but they do it along their, uh, the length of their body. Okay. Um, in the class of sarcopterygy, we have uh, different groups. We have the order uh, coelacanthiformes. These are the coelacanths. There's a coelacanth there. There's these really big fish that were thought to be extinct. Uh, and then they were rediscovered in 1938. And every now and then in the Indian Ocean, someone will catch one of these. And, um, and it's pretty amazing. And they, they pull it up. Nobody knows what it is. And that is the coelacanth fish. And, and we have a model of one, or we did in our stem center. It looks just like this one here. They have a three-lobed caudal fin. So there, there, and there. So that's kind of unusual. They have a fleshy operculum. So they have the bony plate, but then it's kind of soft and squishy on the end. And they have a jointed skull and they're viviparous. Uh, they have this structure called an austral organ, rostral organ, sorry, uh, on the front uh, that is used kind of like in sharks for sensing uh, electromagnetic fields uh, up close. And they can use that to find food and things of that sort in a close proximity, probably down on the ground, buried beneath the soil uh, or, or beneath the sediments on the bottom of the ocean. They're probably sensing things that are below the water there. And they were thought to have gone extinct. They're, they're in the fossil record and they were thought to have gone extinct, you know, over 65 million years ago, but then they caught them back in the 1930s and still every now and then they catch one um, and it makes the you know, it's, it's, a, and it's, it's an exciting thing because they're still around. And so it's a very much, it's like a fish. Uh, well, it, it's a fish, but it has these sort of tetrapod looking features as if it's sort of getting ready to come on to land. And so the idea is not that the coelacanth itself is a um, evolutionary link to something that came on land, but rather it's a, it's a perfect example of how that body form has changed over time. This happens to still be around, but that same sort of strategy could have led to the evolution of tetrapods on land after. So we also then have the, uh, in the class Sarcoptergy, the subclass Dipnoi. These are the lung fish. These are freshwater fish. Uh, that actually have lungs um, that is a modification from sw the swim bladder. They breathe air and they have homologous structures to tetrapods and slender uh, fins. They tend to have a single long tapered caudal tail. Um, they're omnivorous and they, they can um, survive a long time even when things dry out. So a condition called estivation is where an animal, it's kind of like hibernation, but it's done usually in dry times. So there are these fish that when a pond or lake dries out for sometimes up to four years can survive buried in the mud and they're estivating. It's like they're asleep. It's like they're hibernating, but it's not cold. It's hot and dry and they can remain in this dormant state. And when the rains come back or a flood comes, they come out and they become a fish again. And that's often quite surprising for people uh, that don't know a lot about fish because fish are like things that are in water you always think of. Um, but there are some fish actually that can uh, breathe air and can survive uh, for a good amount of time outside uh, on land. And sometimes they are estivating. There are even catfish, walking catfish they're called, that will crawl out of one pond and walk across a road and go into another pond. It's not that most fish do that. Most fish don't, but there are some. There's a lot of fish in the world and there are some fish that can do a pretty decent job of surviving on land. Um, the Dipnoi have the largest genomes among any vertebrate. They have more DNA and, and more um, genetic material that other fish 
And I don't know that there's any particular reason why we know that, just that it happens to be there. So uh, then when we go into the class Actopterygy, uh, which is the largest of the classes, uh, there are several different orders. Now, remember in, um, in lab, um, I'm going to give you the sheet if you needed a super order or order. But in lecture, which is what we're covering now, there are certain ones I want you to know because they're kind of common and I want you to know the names of them. So these five here are kind of unique and these you'll have to know in lecture from, from memory. So not all of them, but just these five. So first we'll do the Asapiziformes and these are the sturgeons. There's a sturgeon down there. And they have a mostly cartilaginous skeleton and a heterocerusal caudal fin and a spiral valve. Those are all very shark-like characteristics. So this is a very primitive fish in bony fish evolutionary history. And it dates back to the Triassic, probably 245 million years ago, a very long time. So this is a, a, a very um, evolutionary, this fish probably broke off from other fish and sharks way back compared to the other ones. They lack a, uh, ver uh, I think it's actually a, a vertebral centra. I think I've spelled it wrong there. It's called a centrum um, is one. But this center part here is usually in us is bone. Okay, so if you look at a, if you look at a human uh, vertebral column, the center body portion is all bone. They lack that. This is um, cartilage on the inside uh, there, which is very much a shark characteristic as well. Then we have the Cypraniformes, which is a very big order, second largest order, minnows, carps, and shiners. Um, you know, th these are people winning a goldfish, which is a kind of Cypraniformes. Um, if you go to the fair and you win a goldfish, uh, my neighbor across the street went to the fair, won what they thought was a goldfish, but now they think it's a carp because this thing's been alive for like nine years now and it's like this big. Um, and I had my friend look at it um, and he thinks it's a carp as well. Uh, they have an early pharyngeal system uh, suggesting that they have a, a more uh, throat-like development structure that you see uh, later on in the evolution of uh, other organisms like our pharyngeal uh, throat in tetrapods. So you see the early development of that in the Cypraniformes. And then you have the order Synganthiformes, and Synganthiformes applies that their jaws or, or, or their, their jaws are fused together, and it means conjoined jaws. And so in something like a seahorse, their mouth opens very little. Um, they have this very tiny mouth because a lot of their mouth is fused closed. This includes seahorses and pipefish and they have a prehensile tail which they use to hold on to things. And the interesting things about seahorses and pipefish is that the males will take care of the eggs. The males have a pouch on them and the males carry um, the baby seahorses after they're fertilized. The mom takes off and does whatever female seahorses do, but the males take care of the baby seahorse. Sometimes you'll see they'll call it a pregnant male, um, which is very inaccurate because it's not that the um, it's not that the male is actually pregnant per se, but rather has an external pouch where the babies can uh, live, kind of like a kangaroo almost. Um, but without the nutrients per se. And what's interesting about that is in most, um, if, if, you, if you look at most animals in the animal world, most of the time what you see is in most animals, females do most of the parental care and males generally will compete to mate with females and then the male doesn't do much after that. Okay, kind of a common theme you see in the animal world. But there are exceptions to that where it's exactly the opposite and where it appears instead that the males, like in these seahorses here, 
do most of the work. And what you find is that's interesting is that that females will be more willing to have sex with just about any male, but the males are more careful. The males are more picky at which female they're going to mate with. And the idea is that it, it's, it's this parental care model that whoever does the majority of parental care is the choosier of the sex. And that seems, in this case, at least to support that, the males uh, are a little more careful because they've got to take care of all these damn baby seahorses. And if they have too many of them, then how are they going to take care of them? Because the female's going to take off and do whatever. And so the male's going to be stuck um, with these seahorses. So the male has to be more careful. Anyway, just one of those things you, you wouldn't be getting uh, your money's worth if you didn't hear the seahorse story if you didn't know it already, okay? Then we have the, once again, we're still in the actopterygy, where they have the scrombiformes, and the scrombiformes are the tuna and the mackerel, generally very, very fast swimming fish, some of them up to 45, 60 miles per hour, and they're a very strong um, caudal fin, uh, long, strong caudal fin, and they have these little finlets here um, that, that um, you can see on the top, the dorsal and the ventral side of the fish. They're very streamlined fish, very fast swimmers. 45, 60 miles per hour um, in water is incredibly fast. If you think about how difficult it is uh, to move through the water, if you take something like a human, uh, which is terribly slow, you know, even someone like Michael Phelps, the fastest swimmer in the world, um, probably swims. I'm going to guess, you know, four miles per hour. I'm going to look it up and, and see. Um, it's not fast. I bet. I mean, it's, it's faster than me. Uh, I'm probably one mile per hour. Um, and maybe that's even guessing. Uh, but anyway, they're fast, 45, 60 miles per hour. And then we have the next order is the largest order, 80%, I believe, or so of all fish are in the perchiformes, perchiformes, largest order, which include perch, bass, and the cichlid fish. And they have abdominal and pelvic fins and lateral pectoral fins. So you can see that here they have, this one has two dorsal fins, uh, first and second or anterior and posterior, homocercial caudal fin. This is my typical uh, perch or bluegill. And it has a lateral pectoral fin and an abdominal pelvic fin. So what you're seeing here is the pelvic fin in these fish has moved forward. So instead of being back, pelvis is like your hip. In a Persiformes, that fin is moved very far forward so that the, uh, the pectoral, the, the shoulder, and the pelvic fin are a lot closer uh, to each other. Okay, and we're going to stop there. Uh, we will move on to tetrapods uh, later. That'll be our next group we do. And we'll talk about the evolution of tetrapods in our next lecture. Hope everyone's doing well. And I will talk with you soon.